besides this, you know what time it is. How it is the moment for you to wake from sleep. You know what time it is. This is the time. It is the moment for you to wake from sleep. Now about a month ago, I was taking the Green Line, the Riverside T, into Boston during rush hour. How many of you have done that? It's, it's fun, isn't it? I was there on the T, and a little scene played out on the train that probably happens on a fairly regular basis. You see, there was, as is often the case, a group of people who had gathered into the little section next to the side door, the one without seats, commonly thought of as the standing area, but which is really there for the convenience of people in wheelchairs and scooters. Now, of course, there really isn't anything necessarily wrong for, uh, to, about doing that. I've done it, I bet you have too. It's a little more elbow room. But there is the expectation as well that one will get out of the way if a person in a wheelchair or a scooter needs to use it. And on this particular rush hour morning, that is exactly what happened. Now we're a little packed. Those of you who've done this know there's like a three-car train. We weren't on that one. We were on the two-car train, so we're a little grumpy too. And at the Newton Center stop, someone got on who needed the space and rather politely asked the people who were in that space to move, which they didn't do. Now some of them were furiously texting on their phones doing this, and others were staring off into the middle distance, as you do on the train, with their headphones on. And then there was this one guy who was suddenly very engrossed in his Wall Street Journal. So the man in the wheelchair tried again. Louder this time. Still not. Inertia had set in, and these folks were just not going to move. He was in the train, and he was blocking the door, but he was in the train, so maybe that was what it was. But at this point, someone closer to the front of the train must have gotten the driver's attention. Because then a loud voice came over the intercom, and it said, Hey! You know what time it is. Get your butts out of the wheelchair area and let the guy in. And then he indicated that he had no qualms about making everyone late for work in our train and any train that might happen to be behind us until his wishes were fulfilled. Now, I'm not sure that anyone else in the train, except possibly the driver, knew that he had just quoted the Apostle Paul. But I do think that the driver probably did know. It's a startling enough turn of phrase, and the words were so apt, used very much the way Paul intended. Now, in either case, it had the desired effect, the words and threatening to make everyone late. The people did move, and those of us in the aisle squished a little tighter together, and the door closed, and we went on to Boston. You know what time it is. Like the Green Line driver, Paul is rallying the troops, calling people to their best selves, challenging them to step up and out, literally in some cases, to do the right thing. To shake off their and our comfortable slumbers. To awaken to a new world, a broad and inclusive world, based not on our personal devices, but on the blessings of sacred community. Look up, get up, get going, because the train isn't leaving the station unless you do. And that's where we are today at the Elliott Church. That's where we are on the first day back from our summer worship series. Paul still has something to say to us. Now in our reading today, Bill McKibben does a pretty good job of outlining the problem. We change religions, he says, spouses, towns, professions with ease. Our affluence isolates us evermore. 
We are not just individualists, we are hyper-individualists, such as the world has never known. Now, maybe one or two of you in here think that coming to church is still a respectable thing to do, but the fact is, being in church today, making the choice for collective action and reflection over individual satisfaction, turning down the new in favor of repurposing the old, that is a radical act. Being part of a congregation, a faith community, during a time like the one we are living in, the time that Bill McKibben describes so eloquently in his books, the time that narrows our vision and sucks us into our own little worlds, is a statement. It is a prophetic witness. But it's a witness that sometimes even prophets have trouble with. The story of Jonah begins with the passage that Shane read to us. God tells him to go to Nineveh to warn them of their impending doom. And Jonah, instead of saying, sure God, I'm on my way, sounds like they need me, said, gee, you know, I'd rather not. And then he sneaks off, or tries to sneak off to Tarshish. Now there's a little Jonah in each of us being encouraged and empowered by the culture to the detriment of our spirits and of society at large. We have become liberated in one way from the bonds of community, but at the same time, we suffer from the lack of those bonds. We know that we are missing something. Even in the midst of those liberations and our Jonah-like behavior from time to time, we find that we still need each other. It turns out we still need the life of the Spirit that fills us and helps us to connect to those deeper things. A life of only pursuing or even achieving our own desires and our own goals may at first seem to be a satisfying one, but it doesn't fill the absence we feel. A self-centered universe will eventually implode and crush us or leave us burnt out and unhappy. Our culture and our community depleted. Now this radical act of community that we are engaged in today. It feels so familiar to many of us, and it's perhaps a little new to others. This saving act for ourselves and for others doesn't happen on its own. At least not at Elliott Church. Not at a congregational church. We have gotten here to kick off Sunday because people have chosen to get us here. People heard the still small voice during the last couple of weeks and moved very quickly to shake off any remaining lethargy from the summer and gear up for the fall. People have chosen to sit in on and run numerous meetings, large and small, official and unofficial. They have made phone calls and brochures and those lovely banners outside. They have open their homes and their hearts. They have made time in their busy and demanding schedules. They have visited here to worship in this place in the hottest of days. And now they and we, because I'm really talking about us, we are here together. And I urge you to take advantage of our time together. I urge you to make church a habit this year. I urge you to come to coffee hour, too, and to those non-Sunday activities. And I really, really, really encourage you to bring your friends. I think they'd like it. We have a great deal planned for this community this year. It is a great and exciting time for us. And the work that we do and the fun that we have is, in fact, very important. So don't let Jonah drag you down. Don't bury your head in the paper and pretend we aren't here. Turn off your own devices and make time for the radical act of the Elliot Church. 
It is a blessing to be together today. It is a blessing to move forward once again. So let us now, before our communion together, take a moment in silent gratitude to dream of all we can accomplish. 